14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9. We have ignition sequence start. The engines are on. 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. We have commit. We have, we have liftoff. Liftoff at 7.51 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. We have cleared the tower. Roger. Right here, Houston. Right and clear. Stand by for go for the backup comm check, over. All right, here. Stand by, Wine Bill. Again, over Tanana Reeve at 209er. Roger, Michael. Thank you. All right, how does it feel up there? Oh, my God, look at that picture over there. There's the earth coming up. Wow, that pretty. You got a color film, Jim? Hand me a roll of color quick. Oh, man, you? that's great. Hey, where is it? Quick. Oh, I got it right. Oh, that's a beautiful shot. <laughs> Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hi. My name is Ron Garrett. I'm here with my friends Nicole Stott and Anusha Ansari. And we want to share some stories with you today. Uh, but before we do, we want to set the stage by talking about one specific image. Now, images have the power to change our perspective. They can change the way we see our world. They can change the way we see ourselves. And there's probably no image that has changed the way we see ourselves more than an image that was taken on Christmas Eve, 1968. Now, the story begins 50 years ago, atop the tallest, the heaviest, the most powerful rocket ever brought to operational status, the Saturn V, sat the crew of Apollo 8. The mission objective was to be the first crewed spacecraft in history to travel to the moon, enter into orbit around the moon, and of course to return back safely. Now, this would propel the United States in the race to be the first on the moon, to propel them ahead of the, of the Soviet Union. But after reaching the moon and entering into orbit around the moon, the crew witnessed something never seen before by human eyes. As the crew experienced the Earth rising from behind the lunar horizon, I wonder if they realized the significance of that moment. They had just become the first humans in history to see the, the whole Earth as a planet, and to first to capture that for the rest of us. This famous photograph, commonly known as Earthrise, is probably the most influential photograph ever taken. This image showed us for the first time our living planet, our biosphere, our Earth. It revolutionized how we see the world, how we see ourselves, with its simple message that we are one people traveling on one planet towards one shared future. In this breathtaking beauty is a deep heralding to the, unity, to the unity that we as a species are called to. Since then, less than 600 people have traveled to space. The three of us standing before you have had that privilege. We were able to escape the confines of our planet and look back and profoundly experience seeing our beautiful planet from the vantage point of space. I was born a long, long time ago in a country far, far away, <laughs> in Mashhad, Iran. Um, I loved the night skies. I would sleep outside summer nights and look at those stars, and I wanted to fly up there and touch them. I wanted to understand what they're made out of. I wanted to understand what our world made out of us and how it's built. This love of space allowed me to um, you know, exercise my imagination. When I was 12 years old, before I knew it, there was a revolution in Iran. Um, there were shouting, screaming, burning buildings, gunshots. I was scared. I had never heard a gunshot before. Before I could even adjust to that, there was a war. There was an eight-year war that broke out with, between Iran and Iraq. And uh, th within the first year, there were bombings. There were long lines for food and sh uh, fuel. Um, there were uh, gunshots and sirens. We had to go to shelter. It was a scary time for me. 
But there was one place I could always go at night and look at the beautiful night skies and let my imagination take me to a different place, to a different planet perhaps, some place that was peaceful, some place there were no gunshots, some place that I could take the rest of my family and everyone who wanted to go with me and be safe and be playful. And that's what I wanted to do. On September 18, 2006, I had the amazing opportunity to fly to International Space Station for an 11-day mission. It was my dream come true. I was now actually floating in space where I wanted to go amongst those stars that I dreamed of. I was looking at our planet and I was able to see this beautiful canvas of tans and crimsons of the desert with the deep greens of the forests and highlighted by the whites of the highest mountain peaks. I could see the glow of the serpentine rivers as they flow, flowed into the sea. And it was an amazing, colorful uh, canvas that I was looking at. But what amazed me the most was these deep blue colors, the different shades of blue of our ocean, which covers most of our planet, our blue planet. And I was mesmerized by it. I looked down on Earth and what I could see and feel was this um, energy, life energy coming from it. I could see no borders, no walls, nothing was dividing us, we were all one. And the feeling that I got, the sense of oneness that I had with the planet and with everyone else on it, was something that I wanted to share with everyone. I wanted to be able to tell everyone how we're connected and we're all citizens of one planet Earth, that we're all astronauts on this spaceship Earth going through the universe together. And I imagine how that would transform everyone's lives. So my dream of becoming an astronaut was realized when I, along with the crew of STS-124, launched into space aboard Space Shuttle Discovery. But I remember that first day, that first day in space, the most remarkable, the most memorable, the most amazing thing was when I had the opportunity to look out of the window for the first time. When my tasks were over, I got to unstrap and float over to a, to a window. Uh, it was just absolutely breathtaking. And I remember the, the first thing that hit me was just how incredibly thin our atmosphere appeared. And in that moment, that sobering moment, I was hit with the realization that that paper thin layer is what's keeping every living thing on this planet alive. But in spite of this fragility, I couldn't help but fall in love with the beauty of our planet. It's a, it's a constant dance of, of color and light and motion. And what was really amazing and beautiful was to see the colors change on the Earth, to see thunderstorms casting long shadows across the horizon, and watch the clouds turn from pink to red to gray, and finally to black. And then as we crossed into the, the dark side of the orbit, to see all the lights of the cities and towns, all the evidence of human activity, all of a sudden come to life. And it really gave me the sense that we live on a living, breathing organism. Now we saw amazing things, many amazing things in space. The paparazzi-like flashes of lightning storms, dancing curtains of auroras that seemed so close, it was almost as if we could reach out and touch them. Now, this was an incredibly overwhelming visual experience, but it was it was also much, much more than just a visual experience. What I experienced in space was a profound sense of gratitude. Gratitude for the opportunity to see the planet from that perspective and gratitude for the planet that we've been given. And in some way, I don't think I'll ever be able to fully put into words, being physically detached from the Earth made me feel deeply interconnected with everyone on it. Now, Although I didn't have the, the view of the Earth that the Apollo 8 guys had, nevertheless from space, I was able to look back and see what we have always been. One single human family with a common origin, and now in a very real way, I had a deep awareness of the reality of our common future. And as you can tell, we all... <laughs> we all what? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it's just me. We all share similar feelings about uh, our experience in space. 
even with some of the different twists on the stories about it, the underlying reaction is the same. Flying in space brings us back to Earth. We see a living, breathing planet. It is our home. It brings us back to home. And while there are a lot of complex things that go on while we're in space, I came home with three very simple lessons to share. And that's that we live on a planet, we are all Earthlings, and the only border that matters is that thin blue line of atmosphere that blankets us all. Now these stunning views, they remind us of what it was like to be in space. It is, like Ron said, overwhelmingly, impressively beautiful. And while it looks like we're slowly passing over the planet, I know that we're traveling at 17,500 miles an hour, or five miles a second, which means that we get one of these stunning sunrises or sunsets every 45 minutes as we go around the Earth every 90 minutes. <laughs> Pretty amazing. And these views also remind me, like Ron said, how separated I was. But how in contrast to that physical distance, I don't think I ever felt any more connected to everyone and everything below me than I did right then. Every time I looked out the window, there was some new surprise. The vastness of the oceans. There was a depth and color and texture to them that I had never experienced or felt before. And when I looked out the window, I wanted to see familiar things. I wanted to see Florida from space. I considered Florida my home. But very quickly, Florida became just this special place on Earth that's my home. I don't know when exactly that happened, but believe me, it does. I started thinking about Earth not just as home, but as a planet, as a planet in space, and as a living organism. I couldn't deny the interconnectivity of everything that I saw below me and I started thinking about us all as Earthlings. So during my six months in space, I, I got into a routine where I would, I would almost say goodnight to the Earth. When my tasks were over, it was time to get ready for bed. I would go to the cupola, which is this windowed observatory on the bottom of the space station, and I would just gaze at the Earth for a little while. And as I would gaze back at this, at this beautiful scene, I, I would wonder what the next 50 years would look like? How far would we progress in overcoming the challenges facing our planet? And as I would take in this beautiful scene, I would routinely be hit in the gut with a sobering contradiction between the beauty of our planet and the suffering that exists on our planet. What I couldn't reconcile was the indescribable beauty of our seemingly peaceful blue planet suspended in this inky blackness. And yet, on that same planet, there are untold tragedies that happen every day. So as many of our colleagues report from the ISS, you can actually see the negative effect humans have made on our planet. Clear cutting of forests, mountaintop removal operations, industrial pollutants entering rivers, giant crop burnings that, that cover whole areas of, of, the, of the globe that send smoke to the limits of the atmosphere up to, you know, to cover almost entire continents. I launched into space with the belief that we already right now have all the technology, all the resources necessary to solve many, if not all, the problems facing our planet. And so I spent a good deal of my time earth gazing, pondering the question, if this is true, why do they still remain? And more importantly, what can we do to address these challenges? The seeds to the answer to that question <clears throat> lies in our shared experience of living and working on the International Space Station and the valuable lessons that experience gives us for life here on Earth. So for my time in space, this was my home, this beautiful masterpiece in space, the International Space Station or the ISS. There is no better example of living off the grid than the ISS. <laughs> there are systems that regulate all the conditions that we need to survive. The right amount of oxygen for us to breathe, clean water for us to drink, but these systems are not automatic. They require care and maintenance and attention. And we go about our daily activities, our science experiments in space, and these life support systems are what keep us alive in an otherwise lifeless expanse of space. Through the ISS, we have created mechanical systems in space that do the best we can to mimic what our planet does for us naturally. 
So as you heard, uh, on space station, we rely on machines. These machines are, uh, you know, our life support system, and we take good care of them. And uh, you can bet if something goes wrong with any of those machines, everyone will come together, collaborate, and make sure that we fix it immediately, because we can't live without them. So we're hoping that we can apply the same sense of urgency here on our planet. We're all crew of the spaceship Earth, and we need to take care of our life support system to have a beautiful, peaceful spaceship that we can all live on. Here at home, we need to come together, collaborate, and uh, be able to fix and restore our life support system. In the words of uh, legendary Buckminster Fuller, we should learn how to become crew of the spaceship Earth, not just passengers. And on the ISS, we are acutely aware of the conditions that are necessary to sustain life. And with our help, the machines do this for us. When we return from our time in space, though, even though we intellectually knew it before, we become acutely aware that we require these same conditions down here on Earth to survive. But down here on Earth, it's not the machines that do this for us. They aren't creating those conditions. It's life itself. It's the living, breathing planet. It's the humans and plants and animals. It's the chemical mixtures of air and the oceans. It's the Earth itself, all interconnected, that creates these conditions. It's biodiversity. And as you've heard tonight, the two most important things uh, about the International Space Station are that we have these amazing, strong international relationships that it's built on. But perhaps more importantly, is that we're living there like we should be living here on Spaceship Earth. We must all work together to protect our biosphere, the life support systems of our planet, for ourselves and for the benefits of the countless possible next generations and for all life. Because of this, we decided to get all of our astronaut friends together uh, and we've launched a couple years ago an organization called Constellation. And our first mission is inspired by the work of E.O. Wilson's Half Earth uh, and the Convention on Biological Diversity. So we are working to advocate for and to point attention to this important work and so that together we can inspire the actions necessary for nations to sign and embrace the pivotal Convention on Biological Diversity in uh, 2020. We want to bring together astronauts, and we are bringing together astronauts from all around the world to share their profound experiences of seeing the beauty of the, our planet from space, from their different national, cultural, uh, religious backgrounds, and partner with National Geographic Society and work with all the various organizations signed up for Campaign for Nature. And we want to work with all of you, in addition to that, advocating for this most important set of goals in our civilization's history. So our shared vision, constellations, Nat Geos, hopefully all of you here in this room and anyone that you touch outside of these rooms, is to come together and make sure that we can preserve 30% of Earth's biodiversity by 2030 and increase that to 50% by 2050. We also need to make sure that we meet all the 17 sustainable development goals and we do everything possible to make sure that we don't have global warming um, exceed the limits of one and a half degree Celsius. This is just called good housekeeping. It's called planet, planetary stewardship. And we have to all work together and aspire to live up to these goals. And no matter where we're from, what we do, what nation we're from, we have to do it together and we have to come together to make our planet safe again. Our time in space has proven that when we start from a foundation of awe and wonder, we open the mind to new ideas and solutions that encourage cooperation together. And it's only through profound cooperation and a shared mission that we'll build a future that we all want to, to experience here on Earth. Awe and wonder are the secret ingredient that changes everything. They can allow us to create a better future. There should be no passengers on Spaceship Earth, 
only crewmates. And as crewmates, we are all responsible for the minding of the ship and the care of each other. I hope you can tell that we as Constellation, uh, as our crew, are excited to be uh, joining National Geographic uh, as a voice for uh, the Campaign for Nature. And together, we know that we can create a positive future where all life thrives. Thank you. Well, I think we can agree that that powerful opening is a great tee up for the festival, but also a great tee up for our first panel conversation on the new era of discovery. You know, technology is a driver in so much of our daily lives, helping us explore the world around us and make decisions on what route to take to work, what jacket to bring as we walk out the door. So how can we use technology to advance the exploration of our planet. National Geographic is committed to developing innovative technology with our National Geographic Labs team. I want to share one exciting project that the Labs group currently has in development called the Canopy Drone. Here's a video of the drone being tested in a forest canopy piloted by a Labs team member via remote control. National Geographic is working with the Illinois, in, Illinois Institute of Technology to incorporate autonomy into the drone. So it's capable of flying and navigating through very complex environments without the need for GPS or the need of a human pilot. This technology will radically reduce the cost of monitoring and it will accelerate our ability to conduct biodiversity and wildlife monitoring in densely forested areas where you cannot see the animals from above. The speakers you are about to meet are also using technology to help them explore the world and gather data in new and exciting ways. With that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Heather Lynch is a quantitative ecologist studying penguin populations in Antarctica. Very Nat Geo. Please welcome Heather Lynch. Well, thank you very much. Antarctica is changing, and nowhere is it changing more rapidly than on the Western Antarctic Peninsula, where it's getting warmer, wetter, and the sea ice is breaking up earlier each year. These changes are having major impacts on the wildlife in the region. And as a penguin biologist specializing in population dynamics, it was one of the highlights of my research career when National Geographic approached me as they prepared their November 2018 feature special on the region. They asked me, well, how many penguins are there in the region? And do we know how their populations have changed? And you can see my answer in the graphic behind me. The Antarctic Adelie penguin, their populations have crashed, even as the more sub-Antarctic Gentoo population has skyrocketed. We know that because on the Western Antarctic Peninsula, we can survey these populations the old-fashioned way, accessing colonies by boats and counting nests one by one. But there are some colonies that are too big, too remote, too inaccessible to be monitored this way. In fact, it turns out that the majority of our uncertainty about how many penguins there are stem from colonies like Zavodovsky Island behind me. We can't count individual penguin heads to monitor these populations. So to solve this problem, my lab and several others around the world are pioneering the use of satellite imagery as an alternative method of monitoring these populations. Now, when we're monitoring them from satellites, we're not counting individual penguin nests anymore. Instead, what we're doing is we're using the, the guano stain, that pinkish red stain you see in the photograph. And it turns out that that guano stain that's left behind at the colony, we can use its area to estimate the number of penguins that are breeding within it. So satellite imagery has radically transformed our ability to monitor penguins, not just the ones that we can access directly, but all around Antarctica. And not just in one year, but in every year. In fact, satellite imagery can do one step better. 
because it turns out that the spatial pattern of the penguins on the landscape, whether it's one big area or they're fragmented across the landscape, that's telling us something important about the health of the colony, whether it's increasing or whether it's declining and may be at risk of critical collapse. So satellite imagery is not just giving us more information, it's actually in many cases giving us better information. So the challenge now becomes not can we access these colonies to survey the populations directly, but how do we possibly deal with the volumes of information that we're now getting? We get tens of thousands of satellite imageries from Antarctica every year. And there just aren't enough penguin biologists in the world to annotate and to interpret all of that satellite imagery. So the key now is in automation and with help from the National Science Foundation and NASA and most recently the AI for Earth program, my lab is pioneering the use of computer vision and machine learning to automate the detection of penguin colonies and satellite imagery. One of our big early successes in this arena was our discovery in the Danger Islands of several very, very large Adelie penguin colonies. The Danger Islands is an island chain off the northern tip of the Antarctic Peninsula that is so small, it does not even appear on maps of Antarctica. And yet it turns out there are more Adelie penguins in the, Antarctic, in the Danger Islands than the entire rest of the Antarctic Peninsula combined. And yet the vast majority of these penguins were not known to exist before we discovered them in Landsat imagery using automated algorithms that would find guano for us in places we never expected it. In response to our discovery, the proposed marine protected area for the Western Antarctic Peninsula was expanded by upwards of 2 million hectares to include this important biological hotspot. And it's such a beautiful illustration of how better technology really can lead to better conservation. We can also use satellites to plan expeditions to the region, like we did when we went to the Danger Islands. And that allowed us to deploy another amazing tool for penguin conservation, and that's drones. Drones allow us to map, up in, map out in extraordinary detail all of the penguins at a colony, and we can count each individual nest. But drones also allow us to reconstruct a three-dimensional model of these colonies, as you can see in the lower left of the screen. And these three-dimensional models allow us to understand how penguin colonies are responding to the landscape terrain, but also how over hundreds or thousands of years of occupation, penguins are actually shaping the islands on which they live. The threats that face penguins are as urgent as they've ever been, but with machine learning and computer vision, drones and satellite imagery, we have the capacity to monitor their populations and respond to threats like never before. I'm super excited to see where technology will take penguin conservation over the next decade. And now I hope you're excited as well. So thank you very much. Thank you, Heather. That was terrific. So next, we have a pair of explorers who work side by side in the same lab, looking at life in the deep sea, or what Bob Ballard likes to remind us can be called the final frontier. Please welcome marine ecologist Whitney Goodell and ocean conservation ecologist Jonathan Giddens. So I'm an ocean ecologist and I study the deep sea. What I love about ecology is that it's not a study of things but a study of relationships within a system. And a deep perspective of ecology also looks at the relationship between people and nature. And I developed this, this perspective because when I grew up, I would draw everything that I learned about at school. Every subject had a journal, and I would stay up sometimes all night illustrating the pages. And through drawing, I learned to see nature as a whole and not something with just little parts that are subtractable because in a drawing, things make sense in relation to everything else. And so I believe in the tradition of the early naturalists that art is a partner in the scientific um, exploration of the deep sea. I'm Whitney Goodell. I'm a marine ecologist and a National Geographic Fellow with Exploration Technology Labs. Something that I hear a lot, and I've actually already heard it a couple times this week from some of you, probably, um, is, oh, you work with the ocean. I always wanted to be a marine biologist when I was a kid. I, on the other hand, when I was five years old, 
I told my family on a trip to Hawaii, we were heading to the beach and sorting out the day's activities, and I told my family, I didn't want to snorkel. The ocean was this unknown place. I didn't know what was below the surface, and I didn't want to go snorkeling around in the unknown, which is kind of an ironic start to my career and my character. Um, but it really begs the question, what else don't we know, and how is that limiting us? The deep sea. You've heard it before, we know more about the surface of the moon or the surface of Mars than we do about the bottom of the ocean. The deep sea is a huge unknown. The deep sea is the Earth's last frontier. It's often pictured as a desolate place so remote that it might as well be another planet. But the ocean makes up 99% of the living space on this planet, and only 5% of the deep sea has been explored. So we do not know our own home. Up until relatively recently, the challenge had been, well, how do we actually get there? So it was not even 100 years ago that naturalist Beebe and engineer Barton devised the bathysphere, a two-ton ball of steel that they crawled inside and went a half a mile deep down um, into the bottom of the ocean off of Bermuda. But imagery and photography had not advanced enough at that time to take pictures there. So what Beebe did is he called on a telephone line up to the surface to artist Bosselman on the surface. and. As he peered out of the portholes in the deep, she was up there drawing and painting these creatures that he described as he discovered this area. So while technology took the two men down to the bottom of the ocean, it was art that brought the deep sea into the hearts and minds of people. Now, with the Deep Ocean Drop Cam, developed by National Geographic Exploration Technology Lab, the deep sea is in reach like never before. It's instead of a two-ton ball of steel, it's just bigger than a basketball, and it goes down to the surface, uh, sorry, no, it goes from the surface down to the bottom of the ocean and takes video footage, high-definition video footage of the seafloor. So here we're seeing a six-gill shark down at 900 meters um, under crushing pressures. So this is far, far below diving depths. Um, under crush, crushing pressures and perpetual darkness until the drop cam illuminates the scene. One more back. So how it's programmed to record for a number of hours. Oh, the, so well, we had a video, but it's not playing. Anyways, imagine. So it's a program to record. For, there it is. OK. <laughs> Still imagine. So it records, <laughs> and then it, when it's done recording, it pops up to the, it releases its weight, pops up to the surface, and then sends a chirp over VHF radio where we can um, use an antenna and locate where it is and thereby image the deep like never before. And because this technology now comes in travel size, it can go all over the world. So we actually have video footage, like what you saw a couple slides ago, from all of these points on the globe, and this is growing. Um, but these cameras really open up opportunities for, they open up the doors to opportunistic deployments. So if a ship is going somewhere and they're doing research off that ship, well, great, let's get some cameras on there, throw them overboard, let's see what's down there. And so this is really helping us build a spatial understanding of where things live. But it's really cool that we can take it one step further and we can start exploring why do things live where they live. So in order to explore that, we pull in data, we pull in different kinds of data like habitat data and um, sea surface temperature or ocean chemistry, and we can start layering on that information over what we already have, over our points. And so we start with our points, we, then we can look at spatial things like how far away is it from different habitats like trenches or plateaus? Is it near spreading ridges? What's the sea surface temperature? Does that matter? What's the ocean chemistry, phosphate concentrations, nitrate? So we can start looking at all of this information that already exists. We can layer it on and start really understanding the differences between each of these places that we have video footage. And by that, we can really start exploring the relationships between these things. So with the video footage that you saw, 
in a process of annotation, which is identifying and counting the species present, I construct biodiversity indices so that we can map biodiversity in the deep sea. And with the environmental variables that Whitney showed, I can model the relationship between biodiversity and its environment so that we can better understand and inform management of these systems based on science. But the process of discovery does not stop there. This is from a recent uh, expedition to the Seychelles where we were collecting imagery of the seafloor, but I was also using imagination to sense my relationship with the ocean in deep time. And these are the types of transformative experiences that I want to share from these places. So as scientists and explorers, we often get to go to these places that are remote and wild and beautiful and not that many people get to go there. And I want everybody to feel connected to the ocean as a thing of beauty that they're a part of. And so I think that going forward, we can bridge art and science and technology to together not only go further, but also bring back the awe and wonder that we find. So please follow us into the deep. And if there's anybody also interested in incorporating science into your you know, art, into your science, science into your art, please reach out. I'd love to speak with you. So the deep sea really is our big unknown. And this, you know, how can we protect something? How can we properly protect something that we don't know? The Earth is changing really fast, and we are not letting excuses like it's hard to get there, it's hard to study. We're not letting that stop us from learning about this place that makes up well over half of the Earth. So exploration and analysis really provide us the information necessary to start understanding these things and and really start building what we need to move forward. It's going to take critical action and appropriate, appropriately designed management in order to conserve this part of our Earth. For ocean conservation, we really need to collect, connect, and protect. Thank you guys so much. Great stuff. Thank you, Whitney. Thank you, Jonathan. Our final speaker uses artificial intelligence to catalog bioacoustics in species to learn more about biodiversity. Please welcome Holger Klink. Hi, I'm exploring nature by eavesdropping, and what I would like to do today is to present a few highlights of projects we're currently working on. First, I would like to take you south to the Central American rainforest, which you can see behind me. And this is what the rainforest sounds like during the night. It's very much uh, driven by the vocalizations, in this case, of um, insects, and we can visualize the soundscape to make more sense of it. Let me briefly talk you through what you're seeing here. So on the x-axis, we have the time. In this case, four days of continuous data we collected in Panama. On the y-axis, we have the frequency or the pitch of the sound. And then color-coded, you can see the intensity of the sound signals we are recording. So in this specific case, we have during the day one cicada species, which makes a real lot of noise. And during the night, we have uh, 10 cricket species, which are calling a lot. Um, but the species we are, or the family of animals we are mainly interested in are katydids. There are about 100 different species of them in the area we're working at. And these are grasshopper-like insects, which are mimicking leaves. You can see they come in various uh, shapes and sizes, and they play a really important role in that ecosystem. A lot of animals, uh, including many of the 80 bat species we have there, but they're even monkeys, which specialize on katydid as their primary food source. So we also call them nature's popcorn. That's really what it comes down to. <laughs> and we believe that by monitoring um, catered richness, as well as the abundance and distribution of catered bits, that is a really good indication for us how well a rainforest ecosystem is doing. And we're using acoustics to obtaining this kind of information. Now I would like to take you even further south. And um, no, first I want to show you uh, what the catered sounds like. 
Um, candidates produce sounds which are most often not uh, audible to us because then they're in ultrasonic frequency range, but we can manipulate the sound to make it audible to you. So you have two dominant sound sources here. The higher frequency pitch sound, this one that is an echolocating bat who tries to find a candidate to eat it, and then the lower uh, frequency sound, which you hear, this one, this is a candidate, a male candidate trying to attract a female. So in collaboration with uh, National Geographic and also Microsoft, we're developing uh, machine learning tools which allow us to extract these calls and species ID uh, candidates from our long-term acoustic data sets we're collecting in the tropics. So now I'm going to take you even a little bit further south. Uh, this is the Antarctic Ice Shield. I spent a lot of time down there during my PhD, and I can tell you if you're standing on the ice, there's not a whole lot going on. Maybe the occasional penguin. But listen to what happens when you put an uh, underwater microphone, which we call a hydrophone, underwater. And this is what it sounds like. And in my opinion, this is one of the most amazing soundscapes we have uh, on Earth. These are vocalizations uh, produced by pinnipeds, primarily in this case Weddell seals and leopard seals, which I used to study during my PhD. Marine mammals make a lot of noises underwater and sound travels very efficiently in the water. So really passive acoustics is a go-to tool for us to monitor abundance distribution and also migration of marine mammals, including the endangered ones in the ocean. Now I would like to bring it back to the uh, temperate regions. I'm at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, so naturally I listen to a lot of birds as well. Um, birds are terrific indicators for ecosystem health, but they're also challenging. It's a taxonomically very diverse group of animals. There are over 10,000 species in the world, and a lot of them produce a variety of vocalizations. Listen to this guy. This is a bird which you can find right now in your backyard here in the DC area. It's a brown thrasher. And this species alone is known to produce over 1,000 different sound types. So you can imagine that makes our automated acoustic analysis uh, a little bit more challenging. Um, they also have a tendency uh, to call on top of each other. This is a very short uh, snippet of sound I recorded in Sapsaka Wood in Issaka, where my laboratory is. And in this case, we have six passerine species vocalizing at the same time during a dawn chorus. And what you can see in here is that a lot of their vocalizations overlap in time and frequency. And that's a real challenge for us, to tease this really complex soundscape apart and figure out what species are present at a certain location. But using, again, AI and deep learning methods, we have made really great strides in uh, cracking that nut. Um, we're working on a project which is called BirdNet, um, and we're currently training models which are able to differentiate 1,000 bird species, primarily North American species, acoustically. And moving forward, uh, we want to include more Central and South American species uh, in this analysis to bring this tool into the regions where we have time-critical conservation effort. Thank you. This, by the way, is uh, a wet owl seal, so one of those species you heard vocalizing earlier. That was great, Holger. Thanks for that. Thank you. We're going to have a quick panel discussion in just a minute, but before we do, I have a question for you. Sure. So how exactly do katydids vocalize? So katydids obviously don't have a vocal tract like we do. Um, what they do is uh, we call it stridulation. So they're rubbing uh, body parts um, against another. And what they do is they lift up their wings, and at the base of one wing, they have a sharp ridge. And on the uh, base of the second wing, they have a row of knobs. And by rubbing those two against each other, they're producing these stridulation, which uh, causes the wings to vibrate and um, to produce sound. And it's very interesting also like they hear, their ears are just below the knee and the front legs. Mm -hmm. And they're very sensitive to uh, sound intensity. So it's very directional hearing. And what the females do, they can reorient their body and can figure out from which direction the male is calling and then head it to in that direction where the ma male is actually vocalizing. So it's a little bit like Marco Polo, um, just in 
with, uh, with Katie did. All right, well with that, why don't we invite our panel to the stage here, if we can. So there were some themes that each of you hit on. Um, and one I want to go to right away, and particularly, Jonathan, what you showed us in terms of art playing a role in how we think about science and exploration. How do we think about the impacts as technology advances in the field of the human role in the field? You want to start us, Jonathan? Yeah, I think that it's really the transformation comes on a personal level. It's a personal story um, that really can connect people and go through this transformation that we need in how we relate with the natural world. And I see that technology is a great tool, and it is a great tool to connect us all. But what really, we need art as a partner in this process to help to kind of grab people and help people to um, go through these transformative experiences with nature so that they connect and love nature and see themselves, see ourselves as a part of this thing of beauty. Like it's a, it's um, as another kind of a message instead of like, do this or you're all gonna die. It's more just like, hey, you know, we're on this beautiful, there's just so much beauty to discover and kind of um, have that transformation happen and then have the technology connect us so that it's not just separate little things here and there, but we have this opportunity to really have a movement with technology connecting us. And Heather, with your satellite imagery that you're using, you're in extreme environments where you're doing this work, and so there's always been some limitation of how many humans can go into the field. So how do you see this in terms of scale of the research and what we understand? You spoke to a little bit of it in your talk. Sure, absolutely. Well, I think that that technology really expands the uh, umbrella of exploration in a way that I think is sometimes underappreciated, um, particularly when it comes to uh, supporting people who want to be explorers but can't spend six, eight, 12 months in Antarctica. I mean, I, I can find a million penguins in the morning and still get my kid off the bus in the afternoon. And that, <laughs> that I think really speaks to the power of technology to, uh, to really grow the community. So, you know, one of our uh, explorers, Sarah Parkak, of course, she's been here before, and she's really using that satellite technology for archaeology. But what she's done is she's really unleashed, you know, a whole army of citizen scientists who are helping to look at the work and better informing where we go for archaeology. How do you see the role of citizens uh, in this technology that you're using? No, absolutely. So we created what we call Be a Penguin Detective on, on a website that we developed and it turns out that school kids all over the country have really responded to this and we'll have an entire fifth grade class look for new penguin colonies in satellite imagery and in fact we've had brand new emperor penguin colonies that were discovered by citizens out there um, just exploring because they're interested and it really gives them an opportunity to do exactly what we're doing when we're looking at the, our satellite imagery. So it's a great way to, to scale um, and to get more eyeballs but also just to get people really excited. So Whitney, you talked about the drop cams, and we're all super excited about what we're seeing from the drop cams, but you also talked about sort of how we send them on ships or if somebody's going here or whatever. How do you see ultimately scaling this work? Um, well, on the deployment side of it, I, I think that you know connecting so that it's not just one team that's got to kind of be doing all right. of it. We can't be everywhere. We can't be doing all of that. It really allows for sort of expanding out so that we can kind of, with some training, there can be people all over the world that are, you know, if they're connected to expeditions going on, then they can start kind of creating their army of, or sending off their army of cameras. And, and really what that allows for is, it allows for, you know, footage, information from a huge network across the globe. Right. It's not just restricted to these tiny areas. Well, you talked about using sort of layers of information and data to begin to get a picture of our deep sea. You have over 200 explorers here, and as I said, from over 50 countries. How do you see the opportunities for collaborating with just the groups here? Yeah, that's a great question because um, the data layers part is really an important part of exploring these relationships because sure, you can get video footage of animals, but 
really what's going to give us this information is how does that relate to other things? And that can be so many different things. The human element is going to be a huge part in understanding not only you know, how things are now, but how they're going to change in the future. So connecting with explorers that can give us information across the globe about different types of whatever types of information that they are working with, particularly with the human element, whether it's fishing or pollution that's going into rivers, things like that. Um, all of that kind of information can help tell the story of what's going on. So terrific opportunity for explorers here to connect with you and see how they can become part of that network, Absolutely. yes? Yeah. Okay. Um, Holger, I don't really understand how you deploy the technology in the forest. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Um, so we're building very small and inexpensive passive acoustic recorders, which basically just record sound 24-7 to an SD card. So we try to make them as small and in as inexpensive as possible so we can distribute them uh, to as many people as possible. And especially the work we're doing, for example, in Central Africa, um, it takes a, a lot of effort to get into these jungle areas and we have to carry them all in a backpack. So you want to keep it as light as possible. And then we put them out there and let them record for weeks, months at a time, and then typically recover them and then um, use machine learning to analyze the data. But moving forward, we're really interested in applying these machine learning algorithms in more real-time application, especially for gunshots, poaching, those kinds um, of application. Um, it's really important that we get the information to the people who are on the ground very quickly, and that will be the next step for us to apply these methods in a more real-time application. You know, I spoke in my opening remarks about how many great supporters we have in the audience in addition to Explorers. Some have been truly generous with the National Geographic Society, both individuals, corporate partners, Hubbard Council, et cetera. How do you prioritize your areas, and what would you say to some of our supporters if they're interested in helping you scale this work? Yeah, I mean, a lot is really technology development, and I really want to give a shout out to some of the high-tech industry, which really helps us a lot. So we, you know, we get support from Microsoft with our AI for Earth grant. We're also working on the BirdNet project with Google, and really it's, it's them helping us to push the science to uh, the next level. So we could not do that ourselves. So really, it's this really synergetic collaboration which makes that happen. And um, the more of these tech companies we can help us out, the, the better off we will be. And that was going to be my next question is, how engaged uh, are you with the private sector to bring them in and develop you know, side by side technologies or tools that can help you in the field? Oh, I, I guess I'll kick things off. So we, we couldn't do uh, a lot of what we do without working with some of the same tech companies that, that Holger mentioned. So that includes 360 degree camera technology in the field. Um, all of the support that we've had from Microsoft on the AI for Earth project. Um, just amazing opportunities to go out um, to Microsoft headquarters and learn from the very best out there. Uh, so that's been critical not only for me personally, but also for my students to give them that opportunity. Um, it, it is, as, as Holger mentioned, a really nice synergy between conservation and technology and industry all in one. Yeah, we, um, we are partnering with the National Geographic Society Exploration Technology Lab and reaching out to um, different partners like at MIT Media Lab, um, AI companies as well to help try to figure out how to deal with all this um, this data that we have basically is oh, over 35 terabytes of data right now of that video footage and so we're looking for help in how to kind of pipeline the data to make it a little bit more a, a little faster to analyze so we definitely are looking for partners in that yeah because you can imagine when you're looking at video footage of the deep ocean you have to pull data out of that video, so you just have to sit there and watch it. <laughs> and that takes a long time, so we're working with partners to kind of automate that and kind of streamline that, make that a bit faster. You know, one of the criticisms of AI, as much as we love advancements in technology, and especially those we can apply in exploration and conservation, is that it's pattern recognition. And how do you deal with this issue of patterns today 
and whether they're the patterns they should be or they're just the patterns right now. How do you sort of look at time when you're really dealing with artificial intelligence? Well, this is kind of a, quite a controversial you know, question and an issue. And I would, I guess my feeling is that to the extent that we're able to support conservation, I don't care how it is that we got to that answer. Um, and it might be a, a bit of a black box. But if we can make really good short-term forecasts that are actually meaningful to policymakers, um, that's good enough for me. Because a, a lot of what we do in my lab is that kind of action-ready science. And so however we get there, and um, we may not understand exactly how the models work now, we hope to get there, um, but I think it is improving conservation. So I couldn't help but notice on your slides, there were numerous mentions of guano detection, also known as penguin poo, of exactly. course. <laughs> and we know that that's the trail often followed to tell us where colonies are. Do you see with technology finding other ways forward to you know, uncover where they've been and where they're going? Absolutely. Well, I. I always say, you know, we will never have fewer satellites in the sky than we have right now. Like, we will only get more satellites, more resolution, higher repeat times. And so the future is really bright, and all of the work that we do now investing in how to use those new tools uh, will only continue to grow and blossom in the future. So I absolutely am sure that we'll have better, better sensors uh, more often in the future. Great. And we'll just have to see what, what the technologists develop. Great, I have a question for Holger, but I do want to remind the audience, we're going to have microphones, so we're going to open it up for some questions in just a moment, so please prepare your questions. Um, so Holger, you started with birds, and you've really kind of doubled down on insects. Can you talk about that and sort of how you see insects as kind of the key? Yeah, I'm uh, uh, taxonomically agnostic. I mean, uh, uh, <laughs> A lot of the research I, I'm doing is actually in the marine domain, still with uh, marine mammals. But I mean, we're challenging, uh, we're facing different challenges in different environments. And depending what your question is, you need to pick the right species, which helps you to answer that question. Um, Katydids are uh, a really great group to work with uh, for many reasons. I mean, they really play that important role in the rainforest. And um, they're also a little bit easier than the birds are because typically they only produce one specific call, which is very stereotyped. So from the detection and the classification point of view, it's, uh, it's, it's not as bad of a challenge as birds can be. Great, great. We're going to open it up to the audience now for questions. And I do want to remind you, we're live streaming, so it's very important, if you can, to wait for the microphone before you ask your, ask your question. I think we have one down here in the front. Microphone is coming to you. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for your presentations. They were wonderful. Uh, my question is uh, pertaining to the deep sea camera. What is its capability as far as maximum depth? What is the maximum depth that you have accomplished thus far? Is the feedback simultaneous or uh, real life? Or is it uh, subsequently that you get the information? And finally, do you have to have a cable or something to bring it down, you know, such a long depth and then retrieve it? Um, so. The, there are some cameras, and the original models were full ocean depth, and I believe that that camera did go very near to full ocean depth. They've since made them smaller. The rating is about 6,000 meters, and that's because that can reach uh, a lot of the ocean floor. Like, we don't need to go to the trenches every single time. Um, it has no cable, and that's what makes it so portable and awesome, is because you can just program it to record for however long, and then with a weight, um, take it down to the bottom, and then once it is gone through its recording, there's a burn wire that sets it free, and it fl it's buoyant, so it goes up to the surface and then can be retrieved um, at the surface, and then it's near instantaneous, so we're not streaming up, but you just pick up the camera, go plug it into a computer, and look at your, well, okay, a couple hour download or so, but then you can <laughs> look at it. It's near instantaneous. Other questions? It's stationary, yeah, so it's just yeah. thrown over and it sits at the bottom. The back? So, um, I'm, I wanted to make a, a suggestion, which is that you tie the acoustic 
monitoring to these deep cameras since there's probably limits <laughs> to what you can detect uh, with those cameras. But I had a nerdier question, which was, <laughs> I'm particularly interested in coelacanths, and I've heard that, I've heard the suggestion that there's many, many species of coelacanths that, and we've just not sampling in the right area. So I was curious if there was any particular project with the cameras looking for coelacanth species. So, sort of. I just came back from the Seychelles um, on an expedition to the Seychelles. So every time the subs got in the water, we were definitely looking for coelacanths. Um, but that's kind of, it would be more kind of opportunistic. It wasn't like we weren't just setting out to look for coelacanths. But that's a good question. We should go back. <laughs> <laughs> There's an opportunity for someone right there. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Do you have one in the back there? I'm sorry? OK. Well, I'll fill the air while we're waiting for one. Did we have oh, one back one there? Right there? I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, right here. OK. You mentioned that you needed uh, help on the AI to analyze the video data from the sea. Could you just briefly mention the type of help you need? Yeah. Well, so are you, are you doing pattern recognition, trying to analyze movements of yeah, there's several several um, pieces of that, and we're actually working with a team right now that, um, that for a while they've been building this um, tool that we will be able to use soon. I hope that um, there's the step of simple event recognition, right? So is something moving in the frame? Um, and then you can go the next level of then trying to start categorizing things, maybe not necessarily, you know, species identification that's still, well, A, that's very difficult with these animals even, you know, looking at the footage, but, you know, that really needs to be human eyes at this point, looking at that. Um, but yeah, simple event recognition and, and starting to categorize, that really will um, streamline the process quite a bit, and so that's, that's in the works right now. Sounds like you guys should talk. <laughs> <laughs> I think we had a question right behind here. I don't know if the question is still there. OK. Over here, was it? And this will be our last question. Uh, hi, hi, thank you. Um, Heather, how much of the land have you surveyed, and how much you haven't surveyed, and how many remaining penguin populations is your gut telling you? that there are left to be found? So we've surveyed the entire Antarctic coastline and all the sub-Antarctic islands. We n now do that um, at least annually, but we, uh, we try and get cloud-free imagery of all of Antarctica's penguin colonies every month, um, but cloud-free being the, the key uh, issue there because many of these areas are absolutely covered in clouds. Uh, we continue to find new penguin colonies all the time. So we found a very large population of chinstrap penguins right next to a colony that we had been surveying for decades. Wow. And then this last season, we're able to get there with drones. And I estimate something in the order of 10 to 20,000 chinstraps uh, on those islands alone. And increasingly, what we're finding are penguins showing up where the glaciers have retreated, and particularly the gentoo penguin, whose populations are growing. They will seed new colonies. So new colonies are actually being established um, because of climate change and because of glacial retreat. And so I expect that we'll continue to find these tiny little new colonies popping up over time. Um, so every year we find something new. And um, as our artificial intelligence sort of computer vision algorithms get better, uh, no doubt uh, we'll be finding them even faster than before. I see Jonathan Bailey smiling over here. So I guess that means the panel has brought out all the things we were hoping to cover here. <laughs> but before we close, I do have one question for the panel. So obviously machines are taking over a lot of life in different places. And what we've been talking about is machines becoming explorers, going into the field. Do we think we might actually have a National Geographic Explorer that's a machine in the future? Mm -hmm. well, I think increasingly we're getting National Geographic explorers who are programmers, uh, who program those machines. Because at the, at the end of the day, somebody had to sit there and make those models work. And, and again, I think that kind of speaks to you know, growing, growing the pie for who can contribute to exploration. Comments? I think that that kind of overlooks one of the huge values of explorers, which is the ability, the creativity, and the ability to connect with other explorers and other people. I mean, sure, they're really good at going out in the field and doing what they do, but the strength is really that 
that human aspect. It was a bit of a tee up for that, Whitney. <laughs> I think one thing we can all agree is that you know when machines and humans combine, that's when we're at our best, and that's certainly true when we're out in the field. So thank you, panel. It's been fascinating, and thank you all. Thank you. Please welcome wildlife filmmaker and National Geographic explorer Sandish Kadar. Wow, look at this. This is incredible. I was actually hoping we'd stay a little bit longer in space so I wouldn't have to come in front of all of you. This is quite terrifying. Um, see Derek and Jube and uh, Beverly in the audience. This is um, quite a mesmerizing place to be right here.